Okay, Stace, I don't see the slide. Here we go. Can everybody see that? Yep, looks good. Okay, like I said, I'm Monty Bain, the Southeast Regional Communications Manager with the Cotton Board, and we're gonna do an overview right quick from 30,000 foot. Uh, the research and promotion program is three tiered. It's governed by the USDA. It is uh, overseen by the Cotton Board. And as you see, we collect the assessments, administer the program and communicate to the stakeholders. And this is one of those communications. Cotton Incorporated is our sole researcher. They conduct all the research, they promote cotton to the consumer and they create demand and profitability. Next. The cotton board assessments, each producer and importer of cotton pays an assessment fee. And that's $1 plus 5 tenths of 1% of the value of the bale at the first sale. Producers contribute around 53% and importers 47. And we're over 99% compliance rate with the cotton board. Next. <laughs> Our 22 budget for Cotton Incorporated is $82 million, and that's up $2 million from 2021. The Cotton Incorporated State Research Program allows 7.5% of the assessments collected in each state to go to their localized research projects. And that's what we're gonna to do today. We're going over what Alabama and Florida have done. And the funding is determined by the state support committee and I've got them listed and I think they're on the next slide and they, they are made up of Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated board members researchers and our certified producer organizations. These are the state support committee memberships for Florida and Alabama. Uh, I noticed that uh, David Felix is not uh, on the Florida, but I know that he is, is welcome on that. Uh, also, uh, Lamont Bridgeforth, I don't think is, is uh, recognized on the Alabama, and yet I know that, you know, uh, him being with the Cotton Board uh, would would be available for that. We also have Jamie Geralds and Carla Hornady, and and they oversee each one of those committees. Next, uh oh, here we go. All right, that's my portion of it. Uh, you can follow us on all these social medias, and and here's my contact information. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me, just reach out to me. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Don Jones, Director of Breeding and Genetics with Cotton Incorporated. And John, Don, you can take it away. Thank you very much, Monty. Good morning to everyone. As Monty said, my name is Don Jones. I'm on the staff of Cotton Incorporated. And I'll go over a few slides and give you kind of a, a maybe a 15,000 foot view from Monty's 30,000 foot view. So we're going to cover both Alabama and Georgia pro, uh, projects. You see the dollar figures on the left hand side for both Alabama and Florida. That funding, as Monty just described, is from a rolling year average. And in the yellow box, you see the years that are applicable. This does not include funding that um, we have at Cotton Incorporated we call core funds, nor does it include in Alabama, uh, Alabama Cotton Commission funds. And Dr. I mean, uh, Mr. Sanford is the chairman of that committee. This, uh, the funding we're talking about today does not include uh, those amounts, but you can see the dollar amounts there. Next. The staff at Cotton Incorporated is listed here. In the upper left-hand corner are the various states that we've been assigned to be liaison. Uh, Dr. Hake is on the call. He's our vice president of research and has been handling disease um, since the um, passing of um, Bob Nichols in October of 2020. And also the other members of, the, our, of our small staff 
I should note uh, on the bottom, right in the middle, is our newest staff member, Evie Jaconis. Uh, she started uh, late last fall, and she'll be handling nutrition and plant physiology. And you see each of the disciplines the rest of us are currently handling. Next. Uh, the specific projects that are funded by those dollars previously mentioned are shown here uh, on this little table on the investigator is, is in the left-hand column. And then on the right-hand side under title is this specific um, topic they're, they're covering. Dr. Steve Brown will follow me. He's the fourth one listed there. He's the cotton extension specialist at Auburn. And many of you all know him. He'll cover each of these um, topics in, in detail. And if you can hear my clock in the background, I apologize. Next. We have some online resources. If you're available and interested in these, the top one is uh, shown in blue is the link for the states, various state support programs that we have. Um, if you just go to our Cotton Incorporated website, um, it, it's fairly easy to see and identify and it gives you more details about what uh, specific to what we're talking about today at Alabama and Florida. Below is a grower focused link that has numerous um, videos that you can follow. They're easy to understand. You can skip around them. They're indexed quite well. And that website is cottoncultivated.cottoninc.com. And again, it's shown um, on the slide there. And I believe uh, we're going to turn it over now to Dr. Brown. Steve? Thank you, Don. And, and I will reiterate what, what Don said, um, particularly from the Alabama Cotton Commission, there, there are a numerous studies that I won't be talking about, but I'm going to kind of give a high view. So the first project is from Dr. Kathy Lawrence, who's a minotaurist and plant pathologist here at Auburn. And one of the areas in which she's working is fusarium wilt. And, that is a, a full-born disease that has, in the distant past, or maybe even to the present, is still associated with root knot nematodes. However, we're seeing some fusarium issues uh, apart from nematodes, and this is some reflects some of, the, of her work here. Uh, it, it is a, a vascular disease, and you can cut open the plant and, and see the discoloration there, and then you can see uh, significant effects. And we'll take, take a look at the next slide. There are multiple races known to occur around the world in cotton. And this is a very sophisticated chart that I probably can't understand or fully follow. But the point is at the bottom, race four, uh, when we talk about fusarium up, is an extreme concern around the world. And there's a significant effort across the cotton belt to address this issue. And so this just reflects some of what she has seen uh, in Alabama over the last uh, uh, few years. So next slide, please. These are uh, just field symptoms of what, what fusarium can look like. Obviously, as a, as a seedling, it may take out that seedling, or uh, later in the season, you may see some plant necrosis and die back. Uh, clearly, it's a, a very unproductive plant. And so, um, this is a, a serious issue, and, and her work is, is documenting that and seeing if we don't have some uh, resistance among varieties and then working towards um, mitigation with various controls. Next, please. Another soil-borne pest that's um, maybe not widespread in Alabama, but there are clearly some places, and this shows a field crew in, in um, North Alabama. Uh, uh, again, a vascular disease, and, and um, there are some prime sites and from a research standpoint in, in extreme North Alabama. We'll go to the next slide. This is some of her work at the Tate field, which there are probably three fields in which she works right there north of Huntsville. And two of them are in Alabama, and one of them is in the edge of Tennessee. But this chart reflects, uh, she's, this is, includes 24 different varieties. The blue bars re represent yields high to low. And so you see that we have, in the presence of verticillium, verticillium wilt, we do have some varieties that seem to hold up. The orange line represents the incidence 
uh, the occurrence of the disease. You can see there it seems to have, we seem to have some varieties that may have some level of tolerance or resistance in, in, um, in, and therefore, uh, you know, maybe this is a way to, to, to deal with this disease long term. So she, this, is, this is a good part of her work in the, in the vert wilt area. Next, please. Nem nematodes has long been the, the bane of cotton producers in, in the south and southeast for sure. Uh, root knot is very familiar to most producers, particularly on our lighter soils. And you see some plant symptoms, and this includes um, cotton, obviously, and then you see some effects in, in the soybean patch here. But um, if we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is the root uh, version, the root vision you see, and I, I, I tend to, to think about this as almost arthritic looking plants, uh, at least root, root aspects. If you grow a garden, you might see the same thing on your tomato plants, but um, the, the female lays eggs in the roots and, and obviously it's taking resources from production. And this is a very serious issue and has been for for many, many years across the U.S. cotton belt. So root knot is an area in which uh, Dr. Lawrence works. She also works in another area as well. But go ahead, next slide. Reniform is, is, a, is a nematode that's gaining in prominence across the belt. It tends to be one more associated with our heavier soils. To me, the, the root symptoms are a little less uh, obvious. We'll see a, a slide in just a moment, but you can see some Foliar symptoms, some would refer to that as tiger, tiger striping, but um, it just generalizes in the field uh, just by poor growth. Next slide, please. This is a, a really uh, um, magnified view of the roots, because often with the naked eye, I don't see reniform. And reniform, the word has to do with kidneys, so that's what uh, their, their shape. But they embed in the roots and, again, uh, reduce plant productivity. Next slide. At the Tennessee Valley Station, which is in Belmina, uh, in the extreme, uh, well, in, in um, I guess that's, uh, Mar uh, no, it's in, I forgot the county, not, it's in Madison County. Anyway, I know where it is, but she has two fields side by side, which she's done research in several years. It's what she does in a reniform infested field. And then in one, uh, just to the left, you see in this uh, slide, she produces uh, the same, she grows the same uh, varieties and evaluates the performance. Uh, next slide, please. Well, this is just one, this is me, this is what, almost uh, 11 or 12 years of research showing the effects in the reniform infested um, experimental area versus the non. And you're looking at, uh, as she says, an average of 47% yield loss, but some years are, are, are far worse than that. Uh, so reniform is, is, is a growing issue, uh, uh, particularly on, on our more heavy soils across the state. Next, please. This is a variety trial and, and one also in which she used the, um, the, the soil insecticide and nematicide aldicarb, which, which we knew in the past is timid and currently it's ag logic. But this is a multitude of varieties with and without um, uh, aldicarb. And she's showing uh, uh, really, uh, this, is, this is root uh, egg, egg production, a uh, reniform egg production on the roots. The blue bars are untreated and then the orange bars, she's showing a, a, about a 80% reduction in reniform production. Uh, Dr. Lawrence has done work with other uh, nematicides as well. Uh, this happens to be a product now from a third party provider, if you will. Uh, but she's also worked with um, vellum and, and its derivatives. And I believe there's also a new nematicide coming from Corteva. So she's worked and looked at the reniform root knot and the response to, to these different nematicides as well as looking at variety responses. Next slide, please. Moving on to a second area of cotton, cotton breeding that, uh, that Don supports is with Dr. Jenny Kovenick, who's here at Auburn. This just shows a breeding plot where you have a lot of diversity of, of plants. And, and if you've ever been to a breeding uh, nursery or, or pest, you'll often see a, a, a row of red or a cotton or unusual looking cotton. And the reason there is 
is to help them know where they are as a marker in the field. So they're not actually breeding with that, I don't think, but it's just help them, help, helps them to know where they are. So next slide, please. Dr. Covenant does her breeding or, or, or her crossing of plants at the E.B. Smith Research Center in Central Alabama. She crosses plants there. And then at various locations in the state, she, she tests those uh, initially and then more and more down the line as, as she, she approaches something that might be a little more finished in terms of a variety of cultivar development. So this is just a field example of, of some of our breeding plots, and this would be at the E.B. Smith uh, uh, Center here in yeah, between here and Montgomery. Next slide, please. Now she's done, a, of course, the last uh, since 2017, we've been uh, dealing with cotton leaf roll dwarf flowers, and she's had a significant effort in that arena, and she's really encouraged a lot of work, really across the belt in this project. Uh, this past year, she screened maybe 500, almost 600 lines, as you see here. But in previous years, she probably looked at over a thousand lines, trying to find some level of resistance or, or immunity uh, to uh, cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. Uh, we there, there have been some, there's been some progress there, uh, but not. She's not observed immunity, so she's continuing to screen. She's probably enlarged her, her target, not just to, to say, hey, let's develop or find something resistant to uh, cotton leaf roll dwarf virus, but hey, maybe we can find resistance to aphids. And one of the things that encourages her in that direction is that there is some resistance uh, to aphids in soybeans. So if that can be accomplished there, perhaps it can be done uh, in, in cotton as well. So that's a larger target that she's pursuing. Target spot at the, in, in area like mildew or mid to late season foliar diseases that she's done some work on. Next slide, please. And this would loop in some of our Florida work. Dr. Ian Small, pathologist uh, at Quincy, is working particularly on the area like mildew in concert with Ping Chi at the UGA. I should back up and say that uh, Dr. Kobernick and, and Dr. Chi have done a, uh, have had a lot of collaboration on the cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. But the area like mildew is a foliar disease that we see uh, that there is some variation in variety response there. And so there should be some promise maybe to, to provide us some varieties that are uh, tolerant or resistant or at least uh, or less affected by this, this particular uh, late season foliar disease. Next. And this is just a, an example. Anybody know what this is? This is actually Frigo Brat cotton that was uh, found or discovered many, many years ago. Just showing in the breeding line of cotton, this is a variety or a type of cotton that had some, um, some tolerance to the bow weevil with the, with the strange bracts, the bow weevil did not prefer to lay eggs. So this is what breeding can, we can uncover things like this and maybe deal with some tests. That's just an example of that. So next slide, please. I, I'm, I'm responsible for uh, the umbrella of agronomic studies and I've listed several here and I'm gonna highlight three. Next slide. The first one deals with seeding rates. There's been some great work across the belt to, to say, hey, we probably can plant uh, fewer seed uh, than we think we need to. I know that's an area of, of discomfort for many when we talk about that, uh, but there was a, a, a global review of the literature back uh, published in 2019 by three scientists from Texas A&M, and uh, there were 15 uh, total uh, papers that they uh, reviewed. 12 studies were from the US, three from China, and they concluded a very stark number, but they said as long as the plant population doesn't fall below somewhere between 14 to 15,000 plants per acre, you, you should not lose yield. Now, thereafter, you could precipitously lose yield. So we, we've initiated plant, uh, uh, plant and seeding rate trials over the past couple of years. Next slide. And again, done these at, uh, in South East, Southwest Alabama, as well as we, in 2021, we initiated the trial at, at Belmont. Our goal was to, 
to plant anywhere from one to three seeds per foot. Or if you looked at that in reverse, we wanted to drop one seed every 12, 10, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4 inches. And we had two varieties of, of different character and, and uh, vigor, as well as plant architecture. So next slide. And next slide. Okay, what we'd hoped was uh, to drop these seeding rates, or again, I show you the reverse from the green bars, but we knew at some locations we could not achieve the plant population desired, so we had to hand thin. One interesting observation I wanted to point out here at the wiregrass of Hebron, we use the John Deere E Select planter to, to determine our population, we determine the correct number, but it's pretty clear that well, two, the, the planter could well, not go not. below dropping a seed of every eight or nine inches. So we failed to achieve those populations. So these, again, these represent what we, the actual populations that we did achieve based on our targeted seeding rate. Next slide. This quick results, uh, just an overview of results. These were at the wiregrass in 20 and 21. We can see we made better yields in 20 versus 21. Uh, and e each of these dots, because we, we didn't have an exact treatment, we, we had a, a varying population. So we had 56 different plots, and these represent those 56 plots. Each of these dots represent a plot. And uh, we really saw no statistical effect uh, on yield across the all, all populations at, um, at the wiregrass station in Heaven. And next, uh, we did the same study at Bruton this past year. We did it at Tennessee Valley. And we would expect if we go farther north that population probably has a uh, has an impact and indeed this is not a, a statistically this is not a great fit of line you can see the great variation there but we do see a slight trend towards increasing yields with increasing plant population that's to be expected the, the goal here is not to encourage farmers to plant one and a half or two seed per foot but maybe particularly in a year like this when input costs are, are escalated Maybe if we're planting 45,000, maybe we could plant 41 or 42. Or if we're planting 38, maybe we could get back, get by with 35,000. The research would support that. And this is an attempt to get uh, producers some confidence. So, next slide, please. Uh, um, uh, another area, sort of a novel one we're playing with, is row spacings. Uh, this happens to be 48 inch spacings. We've done this work at uh, Bruton and at Heaven. Next slide, please. Now, the, the real goal here is, is fourfold in my, in my mind. One is, if we plant the same population down the row, we can reduce seeding rates. For example, if we plant two and a half seeds per foot on a 36 inch row, and then we move to a 48 inch row, uh, then we reduce seed costs by 25%. Also, we, I believe we will see a reduction of a, a, a greater endurance of mid-season stress uh, with wider row spacing because we have more root area uh, or more soil area from which to draw moisture. Thirdly, and maybe significant to the lower portion of, of the state, uh, the last three out of four years we've had, we've had a very good crop in August and then late season weather has punished us. And so, Maybe if we have a little wider row spacing and get a little better airflow, we may reduce harlock and bow rock somewhat. And then finally, I would say if we can pick with five heads what we pick with six, I think we can save money. Now, I, I can't prove that, but I believe that could be the case. But our work would suggest that hey, we, we've made comparable yields. Let me back up and say uh, we, in 2019, we had some preliminary studies looking at at uh, 36 versus 60 and 72 inches. And, and my observation was, I thought, particularly in the lower, uh, the wiregrass area, I thought it was costing us yields. And I would say results from Mississippi as well as Georgia this past year sort of support that. So that's why we played with 48 inch rows. But we actually haven't tested at the extreme high end of yields. We've had yields suppressed by hurricanes and tropical storms. We've not really gotten a great handle on the minim minimization of bow rod or hard rock either. So uh, we recognize in this novel approach, you gotta accommodate the whole farm and also you can't sacrifice sacrifice you. So we're, we're still playing here. So next slide. I finish up here 
we uh, Tyler Sandlin at uh, Tennessee Valley manages our own farm variety testing program. And so there's a, a northern set of varieties and a southern set. And what we did is I took the southern set of varieties and planted them in root and tried to, uh, but I don't tell farmers um, what, well, I don't give them a prescription for PGRs, but I think it's valuable for them to know, do I need to be more aggressive or less aggressive as I handle this particular variety? And so we're learning how to, to test this. This was the first uh, attempt. So we had a moderate and aggressive. We would have liked to have a no uh, PGR, but, but we didn't have space this year. But you can see the different regimes, the rates that we use and the timing. Uh, next. Next slide, please. This next slide will show you a result. Uh, look at the, let's say, look at the next gen 5150. What we see here is the final plant height in the yield. Now, yields were extremely depressed, maybe 60% by, by adverse weather. But what we would like to do is take the final heights and then also the yields and say, do we need to be more or, or less aggressive? And this is just, a, again, a first attempt. And, given these yields, hey, who, who cares about what we've done? But it's trying to demonstrate the technique. So from looking at, at the 5150, we, do we need to be more aggressive? Probably so. If we go down one further to, to 5400 and look at the, the heights and then look at the yields, do we need to be more or less aggressive? And that looks clearly like we need to be less aggressive with that particular variety. So this is just a screen that we're trying to perfect uh, just to learn more about varieties that, that are increasing in farming. Uh, next slide, and I think that finishes me. I'll turn it back to Moni. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that report. And now we'll take any questions. Uh, you can either unmute your mic and ask the question yourself, or you can enter it in the chat. 